Hi folks, this is Jeffrey Fox. We're in here on part L of um, real, called Real Parallel Computing, i.e. last section, part K, did sort of analogies to demonstrate what parallel computing was. Here we actually have a shorter section of the realities of parallel computing. <coughs> and this is all part of the cloud computing unit of the Big Data Applications Analytics course. All right, next slide gives you the high points of, the, of this um, short lesson. We have a one slide from Judy Chu on SPMD and SIMD, the sort of overall architectures of parallel computers. MIMD is the other uh, thing, multiple instruction, multiple data, which is actually almost what everything is, SIMD is a special class of parallel computing. And SPMD, single program multiple data, is actually what most things are. You write one, as I mentioned in Hadrian's Wall discussion last uh, lesson, you write one program which uh, runs in on all parts of the problem and does different things because of different data and different boundary conditions. We then compare big data and simulations from a, a, a large, from a largest point of view, which is implicitly parallel. And then we discuss what codes are hard to parallelize. And we do that for both simulations and data. All right, this is really parallel computing in a nutshell. Thank you very much. And the final uh, slide from this uh, section, which is uh, slightly, totally, really quite different, it illustrates uh, Single program multiple data and also uh, SIMD, single instruction multiple data. These are parallel computing technologies. All the parallel computing you will do, whether it's, uh, will almost always be single program multiple data and almost never single instruction multiple data, although things like graphic engines internally to the inner core might do SIMD. And it's all a question of efficiency. Um, uh, SIMD was used initially because uh, if you just have one instruction engine, and that instruction engine was sent to lots of different processing units, that was easier to implement than having MIMD, multiple instruction, multiple data, where uh, many, each, uh, each uh, process had its own instructions. But nowadays, almost always, each, each process has its own instructions, because each process is running independently. And it's sitting there doing its own thing on its own core. Um, but they tend to always be single program multiple data. When you do Hadoop, the maps are all <coughs> running the same code. They're not producing the same answer because they're, um, that same code is using different data on each process. And that data will have will invoke if statements in the code, and the code will be in different points in different, at a given time. So that uh, these are just important concepts you should know about as you delve into uh, the future of uh, whatever we 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 I mean a, a big data programming on clouds. All right, that's it. That's the end of this uh, set of notes on uh, on software. All right. So we look at the classic features of parallel computing. Uh, then we will find that uh, we have SPMD, we have maps, which are um, in the case of simulations, uh, doing this, uh, say they're doing climate so weather simulations. There'll be mesh points divided up, and usually geometrically in three dimensions. And they all be sending little messages to each other to make certain the processors are doing the, com the computing in this part of the weather can talk to the processors doing computing in the neighboring parts of the weather. And uh, often you use what's called a capability job, which is a giant job, which can actually use up to 100,000 cores on the same problem. And you run these in batch mode, jobs take a long time, and these machines all run at 100% utilization. And they're very fault fragile, and if one node breaks, the whole system breaks. and uh, all the maps take the same time, because otherwise they have to wait if you have 100,000 cores. And one core is slow, you're doomed. Can't have that. All right, map produces different, because you can have stragglers. 
because all the strategies mean is you just have to wait for the final answer. Because if you have 99 processes and um, they all finish, one process takes 100 times longer, well, you just wait for it to finish. Those 99 are finished, you can reuse all those nodes to do something else. Um, whereas in the case of parallel computing in general, you cannot do that because the nodes have to do something, then they communicate, and then they iterate and come back. So iterative problems are much harder because you can't give up the nodes to be used by somebody else. And uh, we've already pointed out that uh, pleasingly parallel or map only is a special case. And then we have iterative map reduce, which we showed as um, is the style three in the, of the various uh, six types of map reduce in an earlier, um, earlier uh, slide. And uh, that caches results and supports uh, classic SPMD parallel computing uh, with uh, pretty reasonable with messages being sent back and forth between the nodes. So that's, and as this is linear, this is cl classic parallel computing for linear algebra, and most machine learning uses linear algebra. So, big data. You would think big data would need high performance because that's what big means. Big is high. So of course, we, I mean, although we talk about high performance computing, we could talk about big performance computing, and obviously, big data needs big performance. And so, using HPC, big data should run faster. This is concept is called hyperscale, uh, and is a transformational technology according to to Gartner, and. Um, but it's a little more subtle because maybe the big data processing rolls lots of input output, leaves a lot of distributed data. And so quite how you accelerate that is not so clear. We have all these decently parallel jobs in the big data field, like processing data from CERN. This is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the big CERN accelerator. And these nifty HPC algorithms aren't used because you do what I call Local machine learning. Every event taken by the LHC, and it does billions of them, are processed independently. Um, the slightly more subtle case is map reduce. In fact, the LHC processing is map reduced uh, when you classify it properly and do the full algorithm. However, the largest part of LHC is map only, and that dominates over the reduced stage. Um, here's an interesting comment from Andrew Ng. He noted that. Uh, Every leading machine learning group must have deep learning and HPC excellence, because deep learning is HPC intensive. And um, as I've no noted before, things like topic modeling, clustering, dimensional reduction, <coughs> graph algorithms, they involve a mix of map collected, map point to point, and they all have an iterative structure and they benefit from HPC. And when you use HPC technologies like MPI, the message passing interface, you run 10 to 100 times faster than classic big data technologies of Loop, Spark, Clink, and Storm. Well, another, in, if you look at the pleasingly parallel jobs now, uh, then we have parallelism over users and usages. Namely, um, a usage model is. Um, the long tail of science. We're gathering data from lots of environmental sensors. Um, and that sort of contrast with big science, when a single accelerator or a single satellite is gathering data. And those are actually gives huge amounts of data sources. You actually split up the data. In the case of environmental science, the data is already split up. Um, and these are typically associated with individual researchers. Every researcher has a thousand things which they're deploying. So you get lots of things and lots of researchers. And clouds are very suitable for this problem. And it's often a map only use or possibly some map produce, map produce. Because you want to summarize and collect together results of the different maps. So, and then the difference between users and usages is probably best illustrated by search. In the case of a search, you can paralyze the search, that's the usage. You can, because you can search over independent, uh, independently over all the different websites, all the different collections of websites. 
But these users can also run a separate search. So when you're Google, you actually have two forms of parallelism. Lots of users simultaneously searching, and each search can itself be done in parallel because you're looking over the entire set of data. And that data can be looked at independently and collected together. And so the exact choice of the parallelism, uh, users are always going to be parallel. You can choose uh, you can choose how you parallelize the search and how many nodes you run every search over. Um, here is a um, sort of cosmic summary of parallel computing for big data. And it just says everything is actually using the same basic idea. You're chopping up the model parts or the data parts. You're using one dimensional, two dimensional, multi dimensional, super dynamic, super decompositions. And so you break the data or the model parameters into parts. You put each part into separate nodes. You use the owner compute rule, leaving the data untouched but changing the model parameters. Uh, these computations are called a map and map produce, it's called the computation in MPI. And if that's you're doing increasingly parallel, then that's all there is, except for managing the whole process. If it's globally parallel, namely you're doing a clustering and you spread the data set over the nodes and you spread the centers over the nodes, then you have a truly parallel algorithm which requires significant management of communication. And the final and the nodes have to communicate because each are part of the problem. Then you use a particular communication mechanism, TCP, RDMA. RDMA native support of a high performance network like Infinite Band. You're going to use different communication styles, point to point, collective, or publish subscribe. Um, I described the issues of load balancing for the Galaxy problem. Sometimes the best way to chop up the problem varies with time, with the data. And in the case of the Galaxy simulation, the particles are moving around. And so the best decomposition changed with time. Um, so you can have a fixed task with data fixed or data flowing between tasks. You can have an automatic parallelism like a dupe, or you can have very customized parallelism where the user designs a sophisticated algorithm. Uh, we have different various algorithms. It can be pleasingly parallel, which is simple, or complicatedly parallel. We have to worry about fault tolerance and how the data's output is also needs to be discussed. Um, but these are all roughly the same in all problems and all approaches. And what appears to be big differences are usually either mistakes or more often they're just a different type of problem. So if somebody is doing a piece in the parallel or a map produce problem, they can do things in a very different way than somebody who has to do a large scale weather simulation. Hello, this is the last slide of this set, and it's a rather complicated slide trying to get across maybe uh, confusingly some issues about trying to capture um, what's difficult. So we have across the top is rather clear, it's synchronization constraints. And at some level, parallelism is hard, gets harder as, your, as, as the difficulty of synchronizing the different jobs, different components of the parallel job get harder. Harder and if over here are the jobs which are hard to synchronize, like latent Dirichlet allocation, graph analytics. They're pretty difficult to synchronize because you have very irregular, and that's sort of also expressed here, unstructured adaptive sparsity. That says you not only have irregular sparse data which produces lots of um, irregular. Communication, it's also adaptive and it changes. Um, these jobs in data analytics are not incredibly large, not at the scale of exascale, which are huge 100,000 core jobs, but they are pretty big. Now, here for the um, exascale, we have <coughs> structured adaptive uh, sparsity because the typically when you do simulations, there's a little more structure. You don't get the variation you do in Facebook graphs from um, local local connections, long distance connections, everywhere over the world connections. Uh, the connections between the nodes in a mesh simulation of, uh, say, your battery or an aircraft or airflow or something like that, they have some structure. 
coming from the fact they all come from differential uh, taking differential equations and discretizing them. So these are the hardest large scale simulations and graph analytics and LDA, and they all use the, what I call the map point to point, typically as the um, communication model. Uh, here, up here we have um, H, the classic, the sort of hardcore HPC clouds. That's global machine learning, taking clustering and spreading it over a large machine. You have deep learning, which is also needs to be run in parallel, <coughs> typically involving a GPU and modest modest uh, parallelism over multiple GPUs and nodes. Often or typically, these have linear algebra their core. And it is not sparse. Uh, well, in the case of deep learning, it's sort of block sparse, but operationally it's not sparse. The part that you care about is, is effect, effectively a full matrix. Now, at this end, we have the loosely coupled, which is sort of the current dominant big data category, pleasingly parallel events from the Internet of Things or the CERN Collider. We have scalable databases on Hive and Shark. Uh, that's using MapReduce. They run often on commodity clouds, not HPC clouds, and they often use Disk IO. Uh, it's very relevant. And then when you have Disk IO, you're not likely to have quite so many synchronization issues because you can't. The disk is much is going to disk access is going to boost lots of variation, which will make synchronization unlikely to be very effective. And so you tend to do the Disk IO in very loosely synchronized fashion. So this is not a perfect chart. It doesn't cover everything, but it sort of tries to explain how on the left you have the dominant today's problems. On the bottom right you have the large scale supercomputers. The middle and the top right are the challenges for um, uh, big data problems where I expect to see huge progress over the next few years. So that's um, in a rather difficult nutshell, the situation. And thank you very much for listening to this discussion of the classification of applications. Thank you very much.